for generations, one iconic steam locomotive has symbolized all that was great about British engineering, the Flying Scotsman. Designed by one of Britain's most gifted railway designers and built by a team of skilled workers, the Flying Scotsman was a perfect example of British craftsmanship at its best. It's a very, very lithe, handsome machine. It looks like a mechanical racehorse, and that, of course, is what it was. In an age when British engineering had so much to be proud of, the Flying Scotsman was a record breaker. The first steam engine to reach 100 miles an hour, the first to run non-stop between London and Edinburgh, and the first to star in its own feature film. It's a magic locomotive. It's a bit like Apollo. It's a bit like Saturn V. Such was the love affair with the Flying Scotsman that even after steam was replaced by more modern technologies, it defied all expectations and survived. It was rescued three times by three different millionaires. The whole idea of buying an express passenger locomotive from British Railways was something completely new. Nobody had ever done it before. This is the story of that remarkable adventure, from Flying Scotsman's first days in the spotlight to a last-minute escape from the breaker's yard, a 90-year journey that captured the hearts of a nation. It's spring 2004, and the nation's favorite steam engine is coming home to the National Railway Museum. Crowds of well-wishers have turned out to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, when you got home, you were black and covered in oh, soot. Oh, yes, you were always... And muck in your eyes. And, and you could put your head out the window yeah, then, you see. And that's where the year off. Yes, you could, can't yeah. do that now, but you, you could smell the steam and the smoke. Can you smell that? And go over the bridge and get your knickers all black with soot. <laughs> It took a massive public fundraising effort to save Flying Scotsman for the nation. More than 6,000 individual donations ranged from children's pocket money. If we don't give our pocket money, it might get sold to another country. To pensioners' postal orders and the deep pockets of Sir Richard Branson. They did it because the Flying Scotsman strikes a special chord with us. For lots of people, Flying Scotsman is a part of what makes them British. For many, it's simply part of the nation's DNA. And it's been like that from the beginning. After the ravages and upheaval of the Great War, Britain was beginning to get back to normal. People returned to work and began taking holidays once more. But travelling around the country wasn't easy. The road network was poor and cars were still an expensive luxury. Most people used the train. Railways were booming after the First World War. Passenger traffic was extremely heavy. And the traffic, for example, that went from Edinburgh to King's Cross or King's Cross to Edinburgh up the East Coast Main Line was enormous and growing. But the railways themselves were in a mess. Lack of investment during the war meant that most of the 120 different companies ran at a loss. In 1921, the government decided to reorganize them into just four groups. The big four set about showcasing the best of what they had. The railways realized very early on in their history that they could make what might to some people seem quite an unattractive journey much more attractive by giving it an evocative name and by the 1920s this had really reached a fine art. The Great Western Railway had its Cornish Riviera, the London and Midland Scottish had its Royal Scot, the Southern Railway had the Golden Arrow but the most famous, the most evocative of all was the London and North Eastern Railway's Flying Scotsman. The London North East Railway began operating 6,500 miles of track 
on January the 1st, 1923. Its chief mechanical engineer was a young locomotive designer, Nigel Gressley. The son of a vicar, he was educated at the exclusive Marlborough College, and he began his career as a premium apprentice in the enormous engineering works in Crewe. Just 43 when he took over the reins at the LNER, he became responsible for almost 8,000 locomotives, ranging from small shunting engines to powerful expresses. However, the LNER board thought none were powerful enough to pull the increasingly long and heavy trains on the London to Edinburgh route. Gressley planned to solve the problem by designing a new class of super locomotive. They would be bigger and more powerful than any locomotive ever seen in Britain. And they would be built here at the LNER's main railway engineering works in Doncaster. In the 1920s, more than 4,500 people worked on this site. And Doncaster wasn't unusual. Britain was still a world leader in heavy engineering. Towns like Derby, Swindon and Crewe were dominated by massive railway engineering works. They all employed thousands of skilled men. Peter Tuffery has spent years researching the world of the Doncaster plant works. There would be lots of locomotives all lined up here all waiting to go into the Crimsall repair shop for what was called heavy general repairs. They would come out and they would go into the paint shop here and they would be painted, lined, and they would look new and pristine and go out onto the main line to do their work. Most of the original plant works have been demolished, but the erecting shop is still here. Used these days to repair engines. In the 1920s, it's where they assembled them. The LNER, like the other railway companies, was proud of its engineering tradition and employed a full-time photographer here. What a great job it must have been coming every day to photograph locomotives. <laughs> sort of job I would have liked that. You would always recognise the foreman because he would be uh, generally a portly sort of guy with a bowler hat. And all the workers would be wearing flat caps and he would be watching you. And one thing that does shock me is how young some of the workers are. They would be 13 and 14, perhaps. That's quite alarming for us today, I think, considering the dangers that you would find in working conditions here. This was where the Doncaster workforce would turn Gresley's designs for the biggest locomotive ever seen in Britain into the real thing. The workforce included every engineering skill imaginable. There were blacksmiths, fitters, boilermakers, and every component was made in the plant. The atmosphere would have been charged with heat, sweat, and noise. It really was a hell of the noise in the boiler shop and the Crimsall repair shop is fantastic, which is probably one reason why I'm deaf today. <laughs> when he began work as a premium apprentice in Doncaster, Peter Townend was just 16. Everything came in as the sort of raw material for a locomotive, forged and cast. He got people heating up rivets and putting them through holes and bashing them. It was out of this cauldron of heat and noise that the third of Nigel Gresley's new class of super locomotive emerged on the 7th of February, 1923. Reaction to it, strikingly from the men, is this is colossal. This is an enormous machine, and not only is it enormous, but for the first time, the, the driver's been thought of, and all the controls are easily to hand. 
And behind the controls was an enormous firebox with a 40-foot square grate. The scale of the fire it produced made sure the engine could maintain steam pressure over long distances. But it wasn't just size that distinguished this new class of locomotive from what had gone before. The wheel arrangement was completely new. The most powerful locomotives in the LNER fleet had a wheel arrangement of four leading wheels, four main driving wheels and two trailing wheels under the cab. This 442 wheel arrangement was known as an Atlantic class. Gresley put two extra driving wheels in his new engine and an extra concealed piston to drive them. It was called a Pacific class. By February 1923, the three new LNER Pacifics went to work pulling the heavy trains on the Flying Scotsman route between London and Edinburgh. The third one of these huge Pacifics that they built doesn't have a name. It runs around the network and it, it does the normal work that they wanted to do. And then along comes this invitation from the British Empire exhibition to put on a big display in what is the biggest exhibition the world has ever seen. The site of the exhibition in North London was massive. It included a new football stadium, a specially built train link to central London, and the world's first bus station. 56 countries of the empire were represented, and it was opened by King George V on the 23rd of April, 1924. The British Empire Exhibition was held two years running in 1924 and 1925. It was a great post-First World War celebration of Britain and its empire. It was a celebration of what the empire could make, including steam locomotives, of course, and over two years, millions and millions of people came through those exhibition halls at Wembley. At its heart were three massive palaces, dedicated to art, industry and engineering. And the British Railway Companies were invited to display the best of their work. LNER saw it as a perfect opportunity to promote their latest super Pacific class. Their newest Pacific locomotive was polished and wrapped up. But before they sent it off to Wembley, it needed a name. Tradition had it that locomotives were called after famous people, places or royalty. But LNER again came up with something new. They named the engine after their famous flagship train service. They named the locomotive Flying Scotsman. It goes to the Empire Exhibition and not only have you got this loco that looks colossal in British terms, but it's got the name on the side, Flying Scotsman. And really, a legend is born at that moment. The exhibition had 27 million visitors over the course of its two years, and Flying Scotsman was the star of the show. The stroke of genius in its naming and the huge exposure it received at Wembley were the first steps on a journey to celebrity status. Flying Scotsman went back to the job of pulling trains from London to Edinburgh. But competition for rail passengers was intense, and the LNER was constantly searching for new ways to outdo its great rival, the London Midland Scottish Railway, which ran a daily service from London to Glasgow, the Royal Scot. In 1928, they came up with an idea that would take Flying Scotsman a step further to becoming a legend it would star in an attempt on a world record. Well, in Gresley's Pacifics, we have, for the first time, locomotives with the power and the stamina to run all the way non-stop from London to Edinburgh. And the marketing department quickly realised this and decided they wanted to make use of that capability. It would be a daunting challenge. No railway company in the world had ever managed to run a train non-stop over 390 miles. But there were aspects of Flying Scotsman's design which would help. The boiler could produce tremendous power, 
It was large enough to be able to feed three cylinders with steam at full pressure and for long periods. The limitations weren't technical. The locomotives could carry enough coal, they could pick up water en route. The problem was that to ask a driver and fireman to run that locomotive all the way from London to Edinburgh was pushing the limits of human endurance if it wasn't downright dangerous. Normally, the train would stop at a station and a second crew take over, but this was different. Because the journey was going to be non-stop, a second crew would need to be on the train from the outset. The problem Gresley had was that you have your first crew here in the cab of the locomotive, you have the replacement crew here in the first coach, and on normal tenders, you can't get them across. Gresley's genius was to put a corridor through the tender. He designs this and famously uh, he checks it out by putting some chairs along the side of his dining room and one of his daughters discovers him sort of squeezing along, because he's quite a big bloke, squeezing along behind these chairs and he says, well, you know, if I can get through here, my, my crews can get through here. In great secrecy, Doncaster Works built a corridor tender and, on May the 1st, Flying Scotsman sallied forth from King's Cross on her way to Edinburgh. It was a momentous day for everyone, but especially for two of the passengers. Well, I met my wife for the very first time on this uh, Flying Scotsman train on the 1st of May, 1928. Everybody was fearfully matey and excited about this. And we were being greeted on the way by waving crowds with flags and banners. And all the town bands were turning out. Everybody on the train got most tremendously friendly. And we went to lunch and we were engaged within three weeks' time. And so I was let in for 40 years' hard labour. Well, I think that it was 40 years' hard for me, not for you, anyway. <laughs> To run non-stop from London to Edinburgh, it's a massive piece of coordination. There's over 200 signal boxes en route. You only need one of those signalmen to, to pull the signals to red and you stop. And they don't stop. They completed the 390 mile journey in just over eight hours, 12 minutes ahead of schedule. It was a world first and Gresley's stroke of genius was to change the way people travelled, not just in Britain, but across the globe. The non-stop run had been a huge triumph for Flying Scotsman. It had its first world record and its reputation was growing. The LNER now began to use it to promote the company's profile as fast, efficient and forward-looking. The man behind the strategy was the head of advertising, Cecil Dandridge. He took up his post in 1928 and set about creating a distinctly modern identity for the company. One of the first things Dandridge did when he got his new job as advertising manager was to look out for a new typeface for the LNER. Because type really can suggest a very old-fashioned or a very modern organisation, depending on what the type looks like, whether it's serif or sans-serif, or you know, curly or straight, Victorian or modern. Dandridge went for the modern. He chose a revolutionary typeface, Gil Sands, from one of the most extraordinary designers of the interwar years. Eric Gill, Gill had first used his typeface on a friend's bookshop in Bristol. LNER took the new style to new heights. I think LNER were making a very bold decision in taking up Eric Gill's very modern typeface, the sans serif. It was like nothing that had been seen before. 
He was a very strange mixture of the religious and the controversial. He was a risk taker. He was mad on sex, as one of his friends described him. And by the time that LNER were um, commissioning Gill, he was pretty notorious in the public domain. Eric Gill's type was so cool, so modern, so clean, so crisp, so dynamic, that Dandris thought that's the image for a fast railway. It went on its posters, it went on its timetables, it went on its locomotives, it went on its station name boards, and it looked terrific. Dandridge commissioned superb modern posters. Um, artists like Tom Purvis, Fred Taylor, Frank Newbold. These were some of the great poster artists of the 1930s. And if you look at the posters today, the combination of these really clear graphic images celebrating East Coast holiday resorts or the Flying Scotsman train, uh, combined with Gill's sand lettering, gosh, they look modern even today. <laughs> Dandridge and his team were using Flying Scotsman to create a brand based on style and speed. And although they were doing it against a background of the worst economic depression in Britain's history, it worked. Crowds of people would line the platform to take a look at the last word in luxury travel that they could never afford. It was glamour, style, service cocktail bars, cinema, coaches showing newsreels, hairdressers. A typical meal in the restaurant car might include pea soup, followed by roast turbot or roast mutton, and finishing with cabinet pudding and cheese and biscuits, all served with fine wines at your table. All this happened on the Flying Scotsman train itself. By the late 1920s, the public's love affair with Flying Scotsman was well and truly established, and was enhanced in 1929 when the locomotive achieved another first. It was to star in its own feature film. When you see the Flying Scotsman train racing through a very, very, you know, what we call today an unspoiled British landscape, it looks absolutely terrific. And you feel, watching it, I'd like to be on board that train. Well, that was certainly what the advertising manager, the LNAR, wanted you to think. What the company didn't anticipate was just how the locomotive was going to be used in the film. The LNER initially give them full access and they wheel out the locomotive, the Flying Scotsman, and they take over the Hartford Loop to, to run the train on so they can do all their stunts and everything else in real time with the real train. Although the LNER aren't too impressed with the actual plot line, which includes at one stage the heroine, Pauline Johnson, actually climbs out the outside of the train and climbs along the train. It's a scary thing because it's obviously filmed in real time without any stunt people at all. One of the climatic passages of the film is where the fireman who's been sacked clambers over the tender while the train's moving in a bid to knock out the driver. It was hair-raising, it was scary, and it was dangerous to all involved. The focus on the locomotive carries on throughout the movie. Well, the film ends with the driver looking up at Flying Scotsman's nameplate above these huge driving wheels with a tear in his eye, and it goes to show that it wasn't Pauline Johnson or Ray Milland who were the stars of this film, it was Flying Scotsman herself. Old Bob, the driver in the film, is portrayed as having a very human relationship with his engine. But what was it like in the real world? King's Cross driver Ron Kennedy drove the Flying Scotsman regularly in the 1940s and 50s. It was like having control of a massive monster. And if you was a good engine man, and there's a difference between drivers and engine men. If you was a good engine man, um, you used to talk to it and it would talk to you. 
I first met this engine as an engine cleaner. Eventually I'd become a driver and was driving the same engine. Um, you may have the wind against you, uh, maybe rain, and the wind made a difference even to a massive engine like this. But you needed a good farmer to produce the steam because it was a farmer that gave you the, the power of the steam. And it was controlling the speed. You had to know the speeds of the track. I mean, it's not, you know, start up and go as fast as you can. There's certain speeds that you're allowed to do. And of course, when we were first working on these things, there was no speedometers. Drivers never had watches to see the time. You had to look at the clock on the station or look at the clock in the signal box as you run past to know the time. Speed had always been part of the LNER brand. And in 1934, speed was at the heart of Nigel Gresley's plan to use Flying Scotsman for the company's most audacious publicity coup to date. An attempt on another world record to run at 100 miles an hour. Because locomotives weren't fitted with speedometers, Gresley coupled a dynamometer car to the train. The driver on that journey was a man called Bill Sparshat. Sparshat apparently said when they left uh, King's Cross Station, there were bystanders there, and he said, if we hit anything today, we'll hit it hard. Speed started to rise, 80, 85, 90, 95. And just before she reached the station of Essendine and had to slow down, she reached a magic ton. She was the first steam locomotive anywhere in the world to have verifiably done so. The driver and fireman arrived at King's Cross to a celebrity welcome. Dandridge made sure the press were on hand to record yet another remarkable achievement. It made the front page of the newspapers the nation was reading about Flying Scotsman, and the nation was captivated. Everyone, young as well as old, wanted to be part of the story. If you're thinking trains, and you don't know everything about model railways, Flying Scotsman rings a bell. I've heard about that. That's the set I want, Daddy. It's a magic locomotive. It's a bit like Apollo. It's a bit like Saturn V. In those days it was fast travel. In, in the 20s there were very few people who actually went further than the town that was next to their village. So going up to Scotland was like going to another world, another universe, quite frankly. Flying Scotsman represented that, so they were able to have a little bit of that sort of travel in their own home with a model. Models of Flying Scotsman help spread its reputation across the country. Toy manufacturers like Hornby and Bassett Loke quickly found the Flying Scotsman became their most popular product. They were manufacturing replicas using technologies similar to those that have been used to build the real thing. The name Flying Scotsman was everywhere. In just 11 years, it had become a national celebrity. Flying Scotsman was the fastest steam locomotive in the world. It could run at 100 miles an hour. It ran the world's longest distance non-stop train in the world, the Flying Scotsman, from Edinburgh Waverley to King's Cross and back again. It looked wonderful. So it was speed, sensational beauty, record-breaking. How could the locomotive not woo the public? But celebrity status is nothing if not fickle. At the very peak of its fame, the spotlight moved on and Flying Scotsman's star began to wane. <laughs> 